Yes part 11 yeah part 10 was. Well it was something rip Irina maybe she can be reincarnated as angel or something else I don't know haven't reached that far there was 79 chapters but recently it became 83 chapters holy hell anyways might start uploading two videos at a time like another Issei fanfic so you guys can choose what you wanna watch probably am not so certain. Chapter 22. Depression. As usual, Tannen was at the top of the mountain, watching Issei's training that was about to begin. Although, something weird was going on with his face. Tannen looked at Tiamat as if she were crazy, then wiped her ear with her little finger. Sorry, I think I heard wrong, the dragon commented, then raised an eyebrow. What did you say? I, Lavaste Tiamat was heard as a whisper, as she couldn't contain her restless movements from such embarrassing talk. I, am in heat, for Issei. But, I understood that you and the Deedrade wielder weren't a couple. Tannen clarified quickly, trying to understand the situation. And we're not, Tiamat answered instantly. It has to be some kind of mistake, Tannen commented, rubbing his hair as he thought of a possible solution. Have you entered the mating period with your previous partner? No, Tiamat lowered her head, remembering the past. I've never entered a mating period directly. Then perhaps your feelings are playing a trick on you. The dragon commented, are you telling me that I was touching myself in Issei's bed for more than five hours, just because of my feelings? Tiamat asked, then quickly covered her mouth as she realized he said something he shouldn't have said. Wait too, Tannen's eyes widened in complete disbelief. For more than five hours. Seeing that Tiamat began to get too embarrassed, the dragon decided to divert that information for another time. But, I don't get it. A dragon's mating period begins when they have a mate. Besides, you weren't even in heat with your ex. The conversation began to become quite heavy for the beautiful woman, causing her to lower her head even more, while she began to tremble. So how come she appeared now, for no apparent reason? Why are you in heat with Issei, if she's not even your partner? It will be because I like Issei so much more. Tiamat covered her mouth again after her outburst, causing Tannen to look at her in great surprise at her open confession. A huge blush shot up the dragon's face, as she tried to cover it with her hands. He is extremely affectionate, and, I think that the closeness we have had, has been, too much for me. Tannen put a hand to her chin, thinking hard. And how are you now? The dragon asked. I'm good for now, she answered the dragon, beginning to control her blush. Very good, Tannen nodded not removing her hand from her chin. I guess the relationship you two built is pretty special for him to have awakened that side of you just by having him around. Tannen looked closely at Tiamat, finding an answer. I think the best thing you can do is walk away to calm your libido. Walk away, Tiamat asked, clearly reluctant to do so. Tannen watched as Tiamat put a hand to her chest, indicating that the dragon had felt a great sting in her heart. Sorry, that was a dumb idea. Tannen quickly dismissed the possibility, seeing that her friend was going to get very hurt if she took that path. Then I guess you only have one option, the dragon commented, looking at her very seriously. You'll have to explain the mating period to him. Explain it to him, Tiamat blinked in disbelief. Are you crazy? If I explain how it works, I'll also have to tell him that. Just lie, Tannen interrupted her, making Tiamat look at him closely. He doesn't need to know that the mating period kicks in when he's next to his mate. Just come up with something else. Tiamat lowered her head slightly, placing a hand on her chin. I see, she nodded, already imagining how she should tell him. I'm just warning you, this won't be easy. Hearing Tannen's words, Tiamat looked at him intently. From what you've told me, you sleep with him whenever you can. If you get in heat when you're lying with him, Tannen couldn't help but laugh a little at the possible situation. I just hope you have enough willpower to control yourself, or you'll both be tangled up with each other until the next day. The dragon commented with great grace, which only helped to make Tiamat blush fiercely after imagining the situation. Don't worry, I can handle it. She commented the dragon very seriously, although her serious face was completely overshadowed by her enormous blush. Actually, instead of giving confidence, that image of her gave quite a lot of tenderness. Tannen noticed the latter, so she couldn't help but smile at him. She really felt very happy to see her friend after so many years, and to see her so happy. 
It is true that she could be infinitely happier with a certain chestnut of hers as her lover, but she would leave that discussion solely to the two of them. At this moment, he could only be grateful to Issei for having made Tiamat recover 100% from her, and even having the opportunity to see her much happier than when he was with her previous partner. In fact, now that I was thinking about the chestnut, I can't help but remember something very important. The brat just woke up the boosted gear, so his dragon attributes must still be growing, the dragon thought, watching as Issei and Penemu got into attack stance. That means his nose isn't in his best condition yet, a wide rather worrying smile graced Tannen's face. That means that in a few days, Tiamat won't be the only one who will have to have a strong will to avoid mating. To close this first part of your training, I would like you to manage to hit me even once with your sword. Penemu commented, as she affirmed I grabbed her in his katana. Hit you once, but, you're not wearing that ultra heavy robe, the brunette commented, seeing that the chances weren't too high. Furthermore, he knew that if he pushed himself even a little, the armor would break. Hearing this, Penemu lowered her gaze for a short second, thinking of a solution. She didn't want Issei to have second thoughts at this point as they were very tight with time. If you manage to hit me, you will not only finish the first part of the training. I will also do whatever you want, commented Penemu, thinking that the consequences would not be serious at all. In those moments, Issei looked up in great surprise what I want, after that, a somewhat childish smile appeared on the brunette's face as he moved his fingers as if he were a dirty old man. Seeing this, Penemu couldn't help but look at him with slight disgust. I thought he wouldn't ask for something like that, I guess his wishes aren't so different from those idiots, Penemu thought, remembering Barakil and the others. Very good, Issei stopped his strange movements instantly, turning completely serious. I'll make you let me touch them, the brunette commented narrowing his eyes with great decision. Why are all the men I come across the same? Penemu gave a small internal sigh at the thought of Issei touching her breasts. Even so, she quickly brushed it off, since she at least had made the doubts disappear from her head. Issei looked back for a short second, seeing how Tiamat left along with Tannen, and in those moments he remembered the dragon's teachings. She taught me that I should use experience to my advantage. It's obvious that Penemu has been fighting for much longer than I have. But that doesn't mean anything when we're talking about a single blow, the brown-haired man thought carefully, looking like the wind towards wave the beautiful hair of the cadre. Most likely, she thinks I'll just beat her like a normal duel, Issei fixed her gaze on Penemu's katana, then smiled a little. I think that's where I'll get the advantage I need, I have to be very precise though, because it will only work once. Issei proceeded to get into an attack stance, causing a large number of flanks to be perceived by Penemu with a mere glance. Your posture still has some errors. She thought the cadre, then stared into her eyes. But that doesn't matter now. I know it's not something I'm going to master overnight. The breeze ran freely between them, making the silence that was in the moment even more palpable in the air. After a few seconds, Issei suddenly widened his eyes and took a huge leap forward creating a crater in his previous position. Penemu saw him coming easily enough, for her speed hadn't improved much since the first time they'd met. And well, you also have to keep in mind that she is ridiculously strong for a cadre. Penemu dodged the thrust very easily, twisting her body to the side and raising her arm. In that way, Issei's sword passed under her armpit. Penemu turned her katana on herself, to then give the chestnut a strong thrust in the abdomen that would go through him again. However, Penemu never suspected that everything was going according to Issei's plan. The brown-haired man had not diverted his gaze from the katana at any time, waiting for the precise second. Penemu blinked in slight surprise as Issei used his own hand to grab the katana, causing the gauntlet to take massive damage, while deflecting the attack in a direction where it couldn't damage him. When the cadre tried to move, she realized that Issei was still firmly holding the katana. When he wanted to release her, it was already too late. Issei twisted his hand, causing the wooden sword's attack to redirect and hit Penemu's ribs in a heavy impact. The slow motion finally disappeared, causing a strong blizzard to be shot in all directions from such fast and powerful attacks. It was almost like a battle from the Old West, replacing revolvers with swords. Issei's face visibly tensed when he felt the blood dripping non-stop from his hand. But that didn't stop the smile from her face. 
I win, she declared herself, with great conviction. I didn't imagine you would use such a base technique, Hanamu declared, though her smile indicated that she wasn't angry about it. If you didn't have your armor, I would have cut off your hand. That worked precisely because of the armor, Issei clarified quickly, pulling away from her as he made her armor disappear and took her bloody hand. Shit, I can't feel my fingers, she commented, wincing a little. Penemu took his hand without warning, seeing the large, deep cut down the middle of his palm. I should have said three hits, he commented to no one in particular, as she placed a phoenix tear on him to heal her wound. Penemu separated again, taking a couple of steps back. Issei noticed her nervousness, so she couldn't help but raise an eyebrow. The cadre hugged herself under her breasts and looked away. If you want, you can touch them now, she commented, as a blush appeared on her face and her eyebrows trembled. She had never let any man touch her under even a parameter, and she had to say that this was something embarrassing and even humiliating for her. But a promise was a promise. Oh really? Issei quickly approached her, making Penemu's eyebrows tremble even more. I only ask you to be gentle. They are too sensitive, the Kadri commented with great shyness, causing Issei to look at her in great astonishment. He never imagined that they could be sentient. When the seconds passed, and she didn't feel Issei's hands on her body, the woman tightly closed her eyes and screamed. Aren't you going to touch them? Hum, but, I still don't see your wings, Issei's comment made Penemu look directly at his face with wide eyes. Wait a minute, did you always mean my wings? She asked the Kadri, beginning to feel very guilty for having thought that Issei had problems with her libido. Of course, he commented on the chestnut with great simplicity, to then blush slightly. What did you think she had asked for? I, Penemu finally lowered her head, giving a small sigh. I'm sorry, she whispered under her breath, causing Issei to look away as she rubbed at her hair. Don't worry, the brown commented then widened his eyes slightly when he saw how a huge amount of feathers shot into the air. Issei watched them in complete wonder, getting even closer to her. Penemu tilted her wings forward, giving Issei permission to touch them. They're amazing, the brunette thought aloud, making Penemu blush slightly. Issei began to caress them delicately, amazed by the touch. They are very soft, what do you see in them? Penemu asked, making the brunette look at her strangely after that question. I mean, they are black. It reflects all the impurity that exists in my soul. Penemu couldn't help lowering her head with some pain. Pure wings are much better. And what does it matter? Penemu couldn't help but look up at her in great surprise after Issei's comment. From the first day I saw them, I felt that these wings were amazing. Their dark as night color blends perfectly with your hair. Their softness reflects the sensitivity of your skin. And most importantly, they are part of I think that's why it makes them so amazing, because they take care of reflecting yourself, and I'm not saying that it reflects you as a fallen angel, but rather that it reflects you as Penemu. That reflection is what makes you unique, and it's what makes these wings so beautiful. I don't know why you hate them so much. Penemu couldn't help but put a hand to her chest after her words. I don't like them, because these wings remind me of who I am. The Kadri looked up with a look never seen before by Issei. A look that seemed to yearn for an answer. I'm like you, I hate the fallen angels. I hate myself. Issei looked at her with great shock after her last words, before slowly turning serious. Who said that I hate fallen angels? Penemu couldn't help but sneer for a second at the question. When you went to Grigori, you could tell by leagues the revulsion you have for us. And that worries you, the brunette asked, making Penemu lower her head a little. Finally the brunette smiled placing a hand on top of the cadre's head. Penemu raised her head in great confusion after his act. It's true, I hate the fallen angels, Issei placed his hand on Penemu's chin, forcing her to keep looking at his face. They did many unforgivable things to me. But, to me, Penemu will never stop being Penemu. Penemu couldn't help but blink with great confusion after his words. What are you talking about? He asked. I mean, I don't care if you're a fallen angel. I don't care if your wings are impure, I don't care what you've done in the past. Penemu will always remain Penemu. It doesn't matter if you're a fallen angel, or a demon, or even a dragon. I will always remember you as the woman who helped me, as the woman who trusted me for her last mission, the woman with whom I always share a few games of chess. 
I will always remember you as Penemu, and I don't care if you're a fallen angel. I love you just the way you are. Penemu could only open and close her mouth, unable to find an answer to such beautiful words. She brought her other hand to her chest as she felt the sensations that turned her stomach and left her breathless were beginning to fill her more than she could handle. So, Issei took one of her wings and started stroking it. You should start loving yourself. After all, it would be a waste to hate such beautiful wings. Penemu lowered her head with a huge blush on her face as she trembled slightly from the pleasant tickling sensation that her wings were transmitting to her. The Kadri finally looked at her wings, to then lock Issei in a tight hug with them. Her chestnut looked a bit surprised, since she hadn't expected that movement from her. Seriously, I'm sorry for thinking badly of you at that moment, he commented, resting his chin on the brunette's shoulder. To be honest, I don't really like devils either, but I also feel like I can't see you as part of that race. Without a doubt, you are someone very special, she commented herself tightening the embrace even more with her wings. A big smile between teeth adorned the brunette's face. Well, I'm not the only special one, you know, he commented, reciprocating the hug. The next day, Issei was already without his armor, sitting next to Tannen around the campfire. The day had barely begun, but the mist indicated that it was a day with a rather delicate temperature. Even so, the brunette seemed to be much more focused on something else right now. Issei's leg waved impatiently, I should have started my new training by now, the brown-haired man commented, to then look back, looking for a specific person. Why it takes so long? It's strange, Tannen commented, turning a little serious. She is never late. Hearing this, Issei couldn't help but look at the dragon with some concern. Do you think something happened to him? Right after that question, a sound was heard from behind them. Issei quickly looked back to greet Penemu with a smile, but her face fell instantly when she saw the face of the fallen. Penemu had terrible dark lines in her eyes, her face looked slightly emaciated, in addition to the piercing marks left by her tears, indicating that she had been crying for a long time. Seeing this, Issei and Tanan instantly got up in great concern. I'm sorry for being late, Penemu commented with her usual stoicism, something that only worried Issei and Tanan more. I haven't slept very well today, he explained to her, then sat down at the nearby table and picked up a book. Issei slowly approached Tannen, causing the dragon to whisper in his ear. He hasn't even given you the following instructions from your training, he commented she with the utmost seriousness. Her body is clearly here, but her mind is far, far away. What could have happened to him to look like this? The brunette asked with great concern, making Tannen stare at him. Don't know. Tannen closed her eyes honestly. She has never told me anything. Even you are closer to her. Tannen placed a hand on the brunette's shoulder, looking closely at the woman. We abandoned the training for today. With that attitude, we won't be able to do much. Issei's face became very serious, turning away from Tannen. The dragon looked at him with great curiosity after this movement, taking him by the hand. Where are you going? The dragon asked with a raised eyebrow. Issei looked at him, making the dragon startled by his look. You said so yourself, I am closest to her, I will try to help her. Tannen looked at him in mild surprise, then turned serious. Good luck, the dragon commented, receiving a nod from the brunette as he released it. Tannen spread his wings, leaving to leave the two alone, hoping that everything would be resolved soon. Penemu was looking carefully at the sheets that she had to sign. She hadn't even dipped her pen yet. The woman finally did it, so that later a small drop of ink fell on the sheet. Penemu watched the drop intently, and slowly, her eyes began to quiver. The black-colored drop began to transform into a red-colored drop. In a drop of blood, numerous screams began to be heard from the cadre's head, as the sound of flesh being cut by metal was heard at all times. Her vision began to blur at the same time that her pulse began to shake too much, causing her feather to stain the entire sheet. The ghostly screams intensified even more, and after a few seconds, he could hear the whisper of a girl. Her Hermana, the blonde girl's shadowed face appeared in her mind for a split second, while a large amount of blood emanated from her mouth. P-L-O-M-P. The chessboard fell hard to her side, rousing the cadre from her long nightmare. Do you want to play? The brunette asked, receiving a small nod from the cadre. 
The first movements began. Issei watched her at all times, seeing that her expression was quite down, something he couldn't ignore. The chestnut continued playing with her throughout the day, hoping that at some point she would say something. But not a word passed her lips. The silence that existed throughout the day was quite killing for Issei, while Penemu didn't even care about it, and surely it was because she had her thoughts elsewhere. In fact, that was reflected in the game, since Issei not only beat him for the first time, but he won absolutely every game. Out of respect for her privacy, Issei didn't want to ask her anything, but he was starting to run out of time, and the fact that Penemu got up to go to Grigori without even having dinner alone was the turning point to what would come later. The brunette quickly got up and followed her into the darkness. Do you want to walk for a while? She asked her. Penemu stopped to look at him. Her beautiful crimson eyes glowed in the utter night as she gazed at him. After thinking about it for a bit, Penemu ended up accepting. Issei quickly joined her and they went for a walk along the edge of the stream. The walk was long and silent, even quite tense and tedious for our protagonist. He was already fed up with such a sharp and uncomfortable situation, so he finally decided to speak. When are you leaving? She asked herself, walking next to her. I think it's too late now. It was Penemu's simple response, implying that she already wanted to leave. So, Issei took several steps forward, standing in front of the cadre. Are you planning to just walk away, and not tell me what's happening to you? The chestnut asked, blocking Penemu's passage. The cadre looked towards the stream for a few seconds after Issei's question with a melancholy that was not even a bit normal in a common person. In fact, she could see that she was sickly. Seeing that he received no response, Issei gritted his teeth slightly. It's not that he's nosy, nor do I want to know about your life just because. A very concerned look graced the brunette's face. I really am very worried about you, from the bottom of my heart. I want to help you, I want to be able to do something for you. He commented, only to see that Penemu was still completely immobile with the same torn look that he had throughout the day. She was still looking at the water, looking like she hadn't heard a word from Issei. The chestnut's face became completely serious, determined to throw away his last card. Do you remember when you hugged me that day? Penemu's eyes widened slightly at the memory. I said you could cry all you want when you're next to me. The problem is that I can't help you if you don't help yourself first. The chestnut commented firmly, making Penemu look at him again. When she thought she had finally gotten a reaction from the cadre, Penemu walked past her and whispered in her ear. I remember that day perfectly. I also remember when I told you that this problem was none of your business. Penemu brushed past him, closing her eyes as the blizzard made her hair whip violently. Issei could only stand there his serious expression slowly fading into a sad one, as he put his hands in his pockets and headed in the opposite direction. Line jump. Issei flopped down into his sleeping bag without much energy. The chestnut looked at the sky, seeing how the night seemed to be even more noticeable thanks to the passing clouds. Issei stayed there for several seconds, simply thinking. Thinking about everything that had happened recently. Are you okay, partner? As usual, Diedreg always appeared at the most delicate moments for the brunette, trying to support him. Although this time, the dragon did not receive any response. Issei just stared at the night sky for a few more seconds. Soon, that dazzling darkness served as a window into his restless soul. Memories with Penemu hit hard in his head. Her cute and sincere smile, its beautiful black wings, her always seriousness, and her imposing aura as a worker his imposing and beautiful figure, her beautiful eyes shining crimson, those same eyes that have cried more than they should in such a short time. This made the memories of when she hugged him tightly come back to him. He remembered her tears of relief. He remembered the hours they spent together. He remembered when she winked at him. He remembered when she blushed for the first time. A few hours passed. They were many memories. They were all very nice, but painful at the same time. That made the chestnut think. Why can't they just have a nice time and that's it? The last words that Penemu said to him before leaving today came back to his head after asking himself that question. Finally, Issei raised his hand, then clenched his fist tightly and outlined a small smile. Do you know something, Diedrake? The dragon was surprised by the chestnut's sudden change in attitude. You always say that I am someone very stubborn, 
and that I don't know when to give up, you are absolutely right. I will never go back, not until I get everything I want. He concluded, jumping up. Deidre could only smile, seeing that he had worried unnecessarily. Line jump. Penemu's room was completely silent. In it, the cadre slept peacefully on her bed, or is what she should be doing. The pillow was completely soaked from her tears, which had not stopped all night. Penemu's eyes were a little red from crying, and if it weren't for her tears, it would be impossible to guess that she would be so sad right now. Yes, even at times like this, she always tried to maintain that unchanging attitude. Maintaining that attitude allowed him to close his feelings, and that's why he always did it. He even did it with someone like Issei, who was the only person who saw his real crying. Penemu finally sat on the edge of the bed without even wiping away her tears. She directed her gaze to the clock, seeing that it was one in the morning. I'll go have a coffee, she said to herself without much encouragement. Thinking that no one would be in the corridors at this hour, Penemu came out with her completely white pajamas covering her entire body. The woman opened the door, and went towards the stairs. When she turned to put them down, her gaze filled with surprise. The light entered through one of the windows, hitting Issei's body perfectly. The brunette carried his katana over her shoulder. The night light gave it a divine touch, and the completely serious look on her face only helped to further dazzle that fact. We need to talk. End of the first part. Chapter 23. Penemu's Past. New feelings that open and consume your heart. I'll go have a coffee, she said to herself without much encouragement. Thinking that no one would be in the corridors at this hour, Penemu came out with her completely white pajamas covering her entire body. The woman opened the door, and went towards the stairs. When she turned to put them down, her gaze filled with surprise. The light entered through one of the windows, hitting Issei's body perfectly. The brunette carried his katana over her shoulder. The night light gave it a divine touch, and the completely serious look on her face only helped to further dazzle that fact. We need to talk. After finally reacting, Penemu quickly wiped away her tears and looked at him with great seriousness, as was her habit. Line jump. You even came to Grigori. Penemu commented, giving a small sigh, leaning against the ledge. The were alone in one of the many towers of the castle. Issei walked over, leaning next to her. I'm sorry, but you won't get rid of me that easily. She answered the brunette with a slightly mocking tone, making Penemu look at him coldly. I've already told you many times. It's not an issue that concerns you. Don't make me throw you out of here. The woman commented, looking up at the night sky. I said earlier that I was doing it for you. But now I realize that's not true. Hearing this, Penemu couldn't help but look at him with some curiosity. I'm doing it for me. I'm doing it for me, because I can't stand to see you like that. I can't stand to see you sad. I can't stand to see you down. I can't stand to see you cry. I can't stand any of it. Issei. It was the simple word of Penemu, who couldn't help but be impressed by the brunette's insistence. I correct myself. It's not just because of you, or me. Issei finally looked down from her giving her a chuckle. It's for both of us. I, it's just. Issei was surprised when Penemu began to tremble slightly from the cold, as she tried to find the words to continue. I really want to, but I can't. She squeezed her eyes shut as she felt the screams come back to her head. Penemu opened her eyes in great astonishment when she felt how something warm embraced her. Again, it was that sensation that she had felt the first time they both got close. That nice feeling. Penemu couldn't help feeling a little comforting shiver all over her body after the feeling of being embraced by the chestnut. Issei further accommodated his jacket, doing his best to cover half of his body. It's too cold a day for you to go out in your pajamas, he commented, making Penemu look at him carefully. I should have let you change your clothes at least. I'm sorry, he finished, squeezing a little closer to the woman. Penemu continued to look at his face, and did not make any kind of resistance to the approach. In fact, she had taken a couple of steps closer when she felt that the chestnut of hers wanted to attract her. She continued to look at his face, watching as the wind made her hair wave freely. Her brown eyes gazed steadily at the moon, waiting for the answer from the woman next to her. Without her noticing, her crimson eyes had a big flash, while her face began to slowly blush. She was completely immersed in his face and his features. 
for some reason unknown to her. She had been completely stunned and she couldn't take her eyes off of her. Quote dot dot dot. Today marks another year. Hearing Penemu speak, Issei turned his full attention to her. Today marks another year more than what I did. That's why I feel like this. Penemu looked down from her, remembering the horrible events that happened on this horrible day. Another year has passed since I got rid of my original sin. Would you, like to tell me that, story, Issei asked. Doubts instantly struck Penemu, and her crimson eyes reflected it perfectly. When Issei thought that perhaps she had asked too much of him, she nodded. The chestnut blinked, then looked at her with great seriousness. It all started on a night as cold as this one. But first, we must go back to the beginning of everything. Flashback. A new cadre. Barakiel exclaimed, looking from head to toe at Penemu's body. This is amazing. She's Penemu herself. The aforementioned she gave him a bored look, indicating that she didn't have time for this. She fell because she began to enjoy killing. Azazel commented simply, having small flashbacks of Penemu killing en masse, where slowly, her angelic and pure face began to turn into a depraved one, until finally her wings changed from one to another. Black color. She is another person just like you, Kokobiel. Azazel commented, looking sideways at the aforementioned. Now, there are already two cadres who are obsessed with war, the leader commented with a big sigh at the end. Come on, Kokobiel exclaimed with a ghastly laugh at the end. Don't say it like that. It seems like now you're suddenly at odds with our ambitions. The only ambition I have right now is to end this damn war, Azazel commented with an annoyed grimace. Hearing this, Penemu began to listen to the conversation with quite a bit of interest. From what we know, the angels want to summon the humans to war for more power. The idea is to eliminate them before they can. Azazel looked at Penemu for a short second. I was thinking of sending you because you are the strongest, Azazel closed his eyes knowingly. But, I understand that you don't want to take the quest to kill more than 400x companions. Azazel couldn't finish speaking, since Penemu took off her wings, looking for the target. The leader looked at her with wide eyes, before giving a big sigh. Great, she's exactly the same as the other idiot. She thought to herself, clearly referring to Kokobiel. It's the first time I've killed angels, he asked me, what will their screams be like? What will their blood be like? What will they look like if I rip off their limbs? Will they try to fly if I rip off their wings? Penemu asked herself all those questions, which only managed to further increase the psychopathic and sadistic smile to such levels that she almost did not enter her face. When she finally arrived, she killed everyone off without a second thought. To the humans, to the angels, even the animals that came across. Anything that had life was taken from her, and she felt great having that kind of power in her hands. It felt great to see the desperation in the eyes of all of her victims. It was a vice that had no end, and she didn't want it to have an end either. It is over. Penemu wondered with great boredom. Almost all of his body was completely stained with blood. The woman began to walk over the pile of corpses while sheathing her katana. The only thing she could think about was what her next mission would be. That continued like this, until he heard a few small sobs from the church that he had destroyed. She, more than wanting to kill her, felt great curiosity to know who it was. It was highly unusual for a victim to survive her rages, because once they started, she wouldn't stop until she killed anything that moved. The woman decided to fly, spreading her wings. She quickly landed on top of the rubble of the church. Is that cross hollow? The cadre wondered, seeing that the sobs were coming from the only wall that she had managed to hold on to, where there was a huge cross. Penemu approached and quickly opened the cross, seeing how inside it was a blonde girl. Who are you? She asked herself, raising an eyebrow. Seeing the wings, the girl hugged her tightly, taking Penemu completely by surprise. Explosions and screams were heard from outside. The girl screamed and cried. There were bad men outside, that's why I hid on the cross. She explained herself, making it clear that she didn't know that she was in front of the assassin. Penemu tried to push her away, but the girl looked up, where her teary eyes glittered brightly. The cadre's gaze wavered, seeing the girl's eyes. But you came to help me. She exclaimed with a big smile. Penemu pointed to herself, raising an eyebrow. I, yeah. She exclaimed with a big smile. 
I prayed to God to bring an angel to save me from the bad guys. Penemu began to feel quite uncomfortable, and tried to push the girl away. Go with your parents, he commented, looking away. I don't have parents. She commented on the girl as if she was the most natural thing in the world. Penemu looked at her in astonishment at her words. That, I am an orphan. They abandoned me when I was born. She commented, as she clung to the cadre's arm. Penemu tried to push her away again to fly away, but the girl quickly clung to her waist again. Can I go with you? Please. The girl commented, lowering her head. I do not want to be alone. Penemu looked at her for a short second, then carried her in bridal form. I had planned to take her to Grigori and have the others take care of the girl, but I never expected her not to come off an inch. The days passed, and the war continued advancing. At the end of two months, Penemu finally reluctantly agreed to play ball with the girl, since she had nothing else to do and was very bored. That was a turning point, since later he began to give it more importance. Mind you, she never put her above her missions. After all, mass killing was as vital a necessity to her as breathing. Time continued to pass, and Penemu finally asked her age after five months, learning that the girl was ten years old. After almost a year, the relationship between the two of them had improved a lot. In fact, Penemu was so fond of her that she had thrown a birthday party of hers, only having Azazel as her guest. Even so, the girl had such a good time on her first birthday that she first named Penemu after her sister. At that moment, it was when Penemu felt that perhaps, just perhaps, murder was not the only thing that could fill her with happiness. With Azazel's help, Penemu was finally able to call the girl sister, eventually giving her a proper name, which would be Ludmeal. The months passed like water in a waterfall, and Penemu's happiness had never reached so far. She already treated Ludmiel as if he was the second most important thing in her life. In fact, it was so like that, that she gave Kokobiel a good beating for wanting to go overboard with her, putting ideas into him that when he is two or three years older, he would be hers. After that, Kokobiel did not dare to speak to the girl anymore. After the days passed, his birthday arrived again, having the same only guest as last time. Even so, this birthday would end in a creepy way. We need someone to go to Japan. Barakiel suddenly entered the room, completely elated. Azazel blew his horn one last time in surprise, indicating that Barakiel's appearance was not expected at all. The angels want to form a new pact with the humans to bring some kind of sacred weapons. The cadre exclaimed, bringing a sharp smile to Penemu's face. I got this. The woman got up quickly, leaving Ludmiel on the ground. But, my birthday. The girl commented with great disappointment. When I get back from talking to them, we'll continue with your birthday. The cadre commented, caressing Ludmiel's head. Hum, that's not fair. You never take me with you. She commented with a small pout. I would like to meet those angels you always talk to. It will be another time. She declared herself, taking off her party hat. The cadre approached Azazel, taking him by his shirt. Listen well. You're the only one I have any confidence in, so take care of her. She commented herself, before releasing it. Yeah, yeah, Azazel commented casually, dabbing at his ear with his little finger. Penemu shot off along with Barakil, leaving Ludmiel and Azazel alone. When the leader thought about paying attention to the girl, he could see how Rainair perched on the door, wearing her typical masochistic dress, which was not so typical in those days. Do you like it? The woman asked with a mischievous look on her face, making Azazel swallow a lot of saliva. Lately I notice that you're resisting your carnal desires a lot, the woman commented, as she began to bend down in a very sensual way. And I do not like that. She concluded herself, giving Azazel a good view of her behind. The leader tried, but couldn't take his eyes off her. To hell with it, he thought, going towards her and then taking her by the waist and carrying her like a sack of potatoes, making Rainair laugh a lot for it. Ludmiel just watched this with a wooden face, unable to understand what had happened at this time. He didn't have much time to process it, as a rather familiar figure leaned against the door frame. Hey, brat, Ludmiel looked at the subject quite attentively. Wouldn't you like to know what your sister works on? The man asked, cracking a wicked smile at the end. Line jump. Penemu made her way through all the angels and humans. He killing everyone who got in the way. 
Her smile of complete joy and her madness grew bigger and bigger as the blood spattered again and again on her face. The madness and the extreme pleasure of the slaughter had already flooded his mind, so he could only make out the screams of the people with great difficulty, while his vision seemed to be quite obscured, fixing only on the faces of the subjects, and the blood. When he thought he had finished with everyone, he felt someone pull his sleeve, so he didn't hesitate for a second, turning around with that horrifying smile on his face, burying the katana and going through his chest without any remorse. Her Hermana, at that moment, Penemu could feel how her heart almost exploded with pain. Her vision returned quickly, at the same time that her depraved mind returned to order. The only thing he could do was take Ludmiel's almost dead body in his arms, while the girl coughed up an enormous amount of blood. S. Sister. Why? They were the last words, before her eyes darkened completely, running out of life. In those moments, Penemu's mind was completely blocked, while all the memories with Ludmiel went through her head. All those memories were slowly getting stained with her blood. Penemu trembled and fell to her knees, as tears fell non-stop from her eyes that were still completely shocked. He just couldn't process what was happening. She couldn't process that he had killed her. His eyes began to shake violently as the glow in them began to disappear, and he could only do one thing in that instant. Ah, the heartbreaking scream left her without vocal cords, so that afterwards she could only rest her head on Ludmiel's chest while her crying seemed to slowly flood the corpses around her. Finn flashback. After that, something changed inside of me. I was no longer like a fallen angel, but I also did not regain the innocence and purity of an angel. Penemu commented closing her eyes deeply. Issei raised his hand, wiping away the tears that were coming out of the cadre's eyes. Penemu couldn't help but look at him in complete shock, after witnessing that he kept looking at her with that same kind expression, despite what she had told him. Thank you very much. Issei tilted his head, indicating his gratitude. Thank you very much for telling me something so profound for you, the brown-haired commented, to then look up at him. Now, I understand why you feel that way, without a doubt, it is a very difficult day. He said the brown one, to then look deep into her eyes. Although it's not exactly the same, I also have a great resentment in my heart. When Rainer used and killed me, discarding me like mere trash, I felt as if I had been stabbed from all sides. But, unlike a wound physical, they never disappear. The brown-haired commented, putting a hand to his chest. That's what we have in common. There are many times at night that I regret, and think about how we could have been. But even so, there are people who really love me, people who always hope that I am well, people who are also very important to my life. For this reason, I always try to do my best, and to be happy with those people who love me. Thanks to those people it is because I follow my day to day. Thanks to those people who are completely irreplaceable for me. Issei closed his eyes to then place a hand on top of Penemu's head, making the cadre look at him carefully. That's why I ask you. Could you be happy? The brown-haired question just fell when the moon cleared, causing Penemu to widen her eyes as much as she could after seeing the big smile, so genuine that it gave off a large amount of emotions that passed through Penemu's body. Comfort, warmth, joy and, above all, love. I know it's not easy, but I'll support you all the way. He commented the brunette caressing Penemu's head, making a big blush shoot up on his face. What do you say? Penemu lowered her head for a short second, having for the first time a nice memory of Ludmiel. Hermana, that memory was when he called her sister for the first time. A memory that undoubtedly fills you with happiness. I think, she wouldn't be happy either. He commented in a whisper, which could be heard by the brunette. I, I'll try, he concluded, moving a little closer to Issei. Great, was the only thing the chestnut commented, seeing how the clouds began to move quickly. They both stood there for a couple of seconds in silence. Unlike before, this was such a comforting silence, which stirred the feelings of both of them with great happiness. Because you help me, Penemu's question caught the chestnut a bit off guard, although he was able to answer it without any problems. Do you remember when I said that there were irreplaceable people for me? Asked the chestnut. They were both staring at the moon, and even so he could tell that Penemu nodded, indicating that she was looking for an answer. Those people slipped into my life without me even realizing it, and now they are a fundamental part of me. He commented she, pointing his hand towards the night sky, with all five of his fingers extended. 
There are five of them. Matsuda. Motohama. Diedrake. Tiamat. Issei closed all his fingers, leaving only his thumb. And you. Penemu felt like she was knocked out with a single blow after those last two words. Or at least, she felt that way, since she could hardly breathe due to the great wave of heat that was embracing her entire chest, which expanded throughout her entire body, transmitting that sensation so beautiful that it was consuming her completely. That heat so intense that she didn't want her to stop. She didn't hurt her. All she did for her was make her feel great. She wanted these feelings to last forever. She wanted these feelings to flood her entire body so that he wouldn't let her reason. She just wanted to dive into that sea of happiness. In that sea that she makes her heart beat so hard. And all those feelings. All of them. They arose from just two words. For just one person. For that person, who couldn't stop looking with a huge blush on his face. Simply. She was mesmerized by the overwhelming beauty that she found in everything that she had to do with Issei right now. She doesn't know when it happened, it just happened. And she, she was very happy about it. Issei. The brunette looked at her in great surprise, which quickly turned into a blush after seeing a smile so pure on the cadre's face that it rivaled Tiamat's. Thank you. Penemu closed her eyes deeply, then brought her lips closer. Issei could only blush even more when he felt how Penemu's kiss impacted his cheek, transmitting to him all the sensations that she was containing at the moment. After that, Penemu got even closer to Issei, supporting their bodies, at the same time that she rested her head on the brunette's shoulder with a calm smile on her face. I can't believe what I'm feeling, she thought, visualizing the night that seemed to be eternal. You have me completely surrendered at your feet. The image of Tiamat flashed through her mind for a short second, making her laugh internally. Now I understand, friend. It's impossible not to fall in love with someone like that. In fact, there are already two of us, she concluded, snuggling even closer to Issei, enjoying her closeness as much as she could. Time flew by for the two of them, and although they wanted to spend more time watching the full moon just the two of them, they had already enjoyed the views for too long. We'd better go to sleep, Issei commented, at the same time that she separated from Penemu. Tomorrow we will be very busy. Issei was about to create the magic circle to leave but he was interrupted when he felt Penemu tug on his sleeve. The brunette looked over his shoulder with intrigue, only to get a little nervous at seeing the cadre's tender expression. Would you, would you like to stay the night? She asked her with a little shyness that she was barely noticeable. Hearing the proposal, Issei just smiled. Of course. Line jump. When he proposed to stay the night, I didn't imagine exactly this, the brown-haired man thought with a slight cold sweat, while he was lying down. Behind him, was Penemu, who seemed to be very comfortable as she watched him. The brown-haired man became even more nervous when he felt how Penemu got even closer, hitting their bodies. The cadre rested her forehead on the back of Issei's neck, giving a small sigh that contained her happiness. Thank you for agreeing. I really needed it, he commented, snuggling into Issei even more. W what will we do tomorrow? The brunette tried to quickly change the subject. It is true that she had slept with Tiamat many times, but this was completely different. I don't know, the cadre replied, bowing her shoulders. I already had something in mind, but we will have to change the plan. At least enjoy these next two days. You will have a little rest before starting again. Oh thanks. Issei didn't sound very convinced. What did Penemu have planned? Supposedly, the previous training cannot be carried out due to lack of time and now he is going to have two rest days thanks to the new training. Something smelled very bad, but he decided to leave that when he finally resumed his training. Two days off, huh? The chestnut thought aloud, do you want me to beat you at chess like today? He asked in a mocking tone, making Penemu laugh. Win me, Penemu sneered. Keep in mind that she wasn't concentrating. In fact, with the skill you have right now, you wouldn't be able to beat even an amateur. Hey. A small pout was drawn on the brunette's lips. At least, I do know how to cook. Don't you like my food? Penemu asked with a slightly hurt tone. It always comes out burnt and tasteless. I'm sure if you used an oven, you'd blow us all away. Issei taunted her, taking a playful little smack to the back from her from the cadre. If you are such a good teacher, then teach me. Penemu declared, causing Issei to blink in slight surprise. 
The brunette turned his face, to see that Penemu's bright crimson eyes were closer than he expected. Seeing her wistful look from her that begged for a positive response, Issei couldn't resist. Very good, she answered, placing a hand on her cheek. I will do everything possible. Penemu only answered him by resting her hand on his, at the same time that she cupped her cheek even more in the chestnut's hand. In fact, he had liked that interaction much more than it seemed at first glance. Issei turned around again, giving a small yawn. Good night, good night. Penemu returned the greeting, supporting both of her hands on the chestnut's back quite affectionately. She was sure that this would be the first time she had slept so soundly in years, even centuries. But the cadre planned to make one last call before sleeping next to her future lover. A small violet-colored magic circle appeared in his left ear. Do you hear me, Tannen? Penemu. Tannen's plaintive voice could be heard from the other side. What the fuck? It's three in the morning. I'm sorry. Penemu quickly apologized, resting her face on the back of Issei's neck with a bit of guilt. Ah. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter. Tannen gave a big yawn. Are you feeling better? Yes. She gave a slight nod, making Tannen smile. I am glad to hear that. Tannen's pleased voice confirmed her words. By the way, where is the snotty dragon? I didn't see him coming. The smile couldn't help but draw on Penemu's face, as well as her significant change in voice. He is here with me. The rather caring and loving tone was impossible for Tannen to miss. Oh yeah. The dragon's slightly flirtatious tone caused a small blush to frame the cadre's face. They are having fun. Forget about it. I called you about something more important. She commented with great seriousness. At that moment, Tannen's mocking look disappeared from his face. What do you want? In the end, I came to the decision not to do the training I had in mind. He explained with great seriousness. For the next two days we won't do anything, but I need you to bring Tiamat. We'll need her sword to do the training. Also tell her that when it starts, her presence will be needed as well. I'm already running out of Phoenix Tears, and we need to keep an eye on him all the time. Time. From the way you're telling it, it seems that the training will be even worse than what you had in mind. The dragon commented very seriously, seeing that this was no joke. It will be much worse. He commented she, looking at Issei with a small hint of concern. But, it's the only thing we can do with the time we have. Penemu lowered her head slightly, giving a sigh. Also tell Tiamat that the three of us must watch her training at all times, Penemu's gaze darkened slightly. There is a lot of risk of death. Very well, I'll tell him. He commented on the dragon from the other side, unable to hide his slight concern at the method Penemu would use. Penemu cut off the transmission, then looked at Issei with Issei slowly opened his eyes. The brown-haired man couldn't help but give a big yawn while he rubbed his eyes with great exhaustion. It was normal if we take into account that he had fallen asleep at three in the morning. Issei couldn't help but slightly widen his eyes after remembering everything that happened yesterday. The facts hit his head strongly again when he felt like someone was hugging him tightly. The chestnut-haired man removed the sheets in one movement, causing once again the huge, silky locks of hair to shoot out all over the bed. Although this time, there was a big difference, since the hair was not light blue, but a deep black with small violet reflections. Although Issei was wearing his clothes, and Penemu was wearing pajamas that covered her entire body, he couldn't help but blush when he felt how the woman was hugging him so tightly. He seemed like he was doing everything he could to keep him from running away, even though it was obvious he wasn't going anywhere. Issei couldn't help but look away from him to his breasts for a short second, since he didn't have the bandages on, and the front of him left a huge cleavage on display. Penemu frowned slightly withdrawing a hand from the brunette's waist to cover her mouth from her prominent yawn. Her eyes widened, revealing that beautiful crimson glow she had in them, where they now seemed more precious than ever. That was thanks to the flash of vigor they gave off with such intensity, something she hadn't had before. Penemu lowered her gaze, seeing that the prominent cleavage of her breasts was pressing tightly against Issei's chest, something that was quite normal, since she was attached to him. Seeing his look, Issei thought he would immediately pull away, but instead of doing that, Penemu hugged him again and entwined her legs with his. Good morning. She commented on the fall with a small blush on her face, while she snuggled her head into the chestnut's neck. Penemu was completely carried away by her emotions, so she just wanted to be close to Issei right now, 
and continue to enjoy that beautiful feeling that flowed from her chest. That warmth made her wake up as happy as she hadn't done in centuries. In fact, he had never woken up with this wonderful feeling before, and he wanted to make sure it didn't end so quickly. Hum, good morning, she answered the chestnut, hesitating a little at the slightly compromising situation. But he wasn't going to complain. Penemu raised her face, giving him a cute smile between her teeth, something that took the brunette completely by surprise. Thank you so much for yesterday. I mean it. Chapter 24. The Anniversary of the Fallen. Is no one awake? Asked the chestnut in the main kitchen. Penemu sat at the small round table in the center, setting up a chessboard. It's normal that there's no one. She answered the fall, smoothing back her wet hair. He is very early, and no one here is known for having discipline. She explained herself, causing Issei to look at her with a small blush. It was normal, since the woman was still wearing her white pajamas despite having bathed. Therefore, her enormous cleavage was still present, and worst of all, the small drops of water that fell from her hair gave her a more seductive touch. It's a pity, because this place has everything, the brown-haired commented sitting in front of Penemu while he looked at the numerous kitchens and gadgets such as coffee makers, among other things. We probably have time to ourselves until noon. The cadre's words made Issei look at her, seeing that the woman was giving him a small smile. What would you like to do? She asked herself, starting to put the pieces together for her. Hum, the brunette rubbed his hair while imitating. Penemu, after playing with you, I'd like to see the castle. I didn't get the chance last time I came. The brunette looked up from him with a big smile between his teeth. And later, if you want I can help you prepare lunch. Hearing this, Penemu gave him a cute smile, nodding quickly, indicating that she really liked the idea. After that little talk, Penemu placed her last piece, causing the atmosphere to change radically. It was as if out of nowhere they were in the middle of a war, and they were in the crossfire. The game continued as always. Penemu noted a vast improvement in Issei's ability to read plays, but he still had a long way to go. Penemu watched wordlessly as Issei moved a pawn to the front, covering the king from getting killed by the rook. That's the kind of move you'd make. Isn't that a bit cowardly? Issei couldn't help but look at her in confusion, since she didn't understand exactly what she was referring to. The cadre just took the rook, and eliminated the pawn without further ado. You are the king. It is not right for you to sacrifice your subjects to survive longer. Hearing this, Issei fixed his gaze on his part of the board, seeing how numerous pieces protected the king, at the same time that these pieces protected each other. You should always think carefully about what your next move will be. Not to keep surviving, but to make everyone survive. He commented, resting both hands under his chin. The king who sacrifices his companions just to live a little longer is a bad king. It is natural that many of your companions die in a real war, but you should always try to keep those casualties as few as possible. Issei could only look at her in great confusion. What are you trying to tell me? What I want to say is that a good king is not the one who sacrifices his companions. A true king is the one who carefully analyzes the situation, looks for a solution, and tries that the well-being of his servants is always on par with victory, of his kingdom. He explained the cadre causing a small smile to appear on her face as she saw Issei's eyes twinkle at her revelation. Besides, the difference between both kings is crucial for a single point, she commented, taking Issei's king with his hand. The king who always sacrifices his servants to move on will never set his mind to finding a broader solution. In short, that king is most likely brainless and has no idea what the word strategy means. Upon hearing the last part, a small tick appeared in the brunette's eyebrow. Had she said all that just to annoy him? Or was it that those words had a deeper meaning that he couldn't decipher? Being one question or the other, Issei knew that he had to focus on only one thing, stop being brainless. The brunette's gaze focused on his pieces intently, while everything around him turned black, except for the board. He had gone completely still, but his mind was going at a thousand motors per second processing every possible move he could make with his remaining pieces, and also seeing how Penemu could move with such moves. Could I move my horse to the front? And if I castling, would I have a chance of checkmate if I try to advance with my two knights and my remaining rook? How do I defend the king if he planned to attack with a large part of my pieces? 
How do I get those pieces to defend each other? Thousands of questions began to fill the chestnut's head. Penemu realized this quickly, causing a small understated smile to appear on her face. That's, surely you will never ask questions, and if you almost never ask questions, the less prepared you will be to find the answers. She thought to herself, as she narrowed her eyes slightly. Think, and think. Don't stop until you find the answers. If they are negative, just ask yourself another possible solution. Sooner or later, you will find what you are looking for. Issei's eyes shone slightly, then castling. Penemu watched this movement with a small smile. Now, your tower is quite unprotected. But you managed to protect the king, while also not selling your horses. He commented she, taking a small sigh. There were better solutions, he declared, slaying the rook with his queen. But for the first step, it's pretty good. She concluded, giving him a small smile, which the brown-haired man instantly reciprocated. Wow, I didn't expect to find you here. They both turned towards the direction of the voice, seeing that it was Azazel. That's what we should say. The chestnut commented. I'm beginning to suspect that you're taking my companion's training not so seriously, he stated, narrowing his eyes suspiciously. Remember that today is a special day for the fallen, brat. The leader commented, wiping his ear with his little finger. As your leader, I can't miss the ceremony. He explained himself, then fixed his gaze on Penemu. Besides, I'm here because I need Penemu's help. Special day. The brunette wondered, trying to remember. You need my help. Penemu rose from his seat, looking at him with a raised eyebrow. Can't you summon the necessary materials through the magic circles? She asked herself, causing a somewhat nervous smile to appear on Azazel's face. Well, the problem is that I can't summon said materials, if they don't exist in the first place. He explained to her, rubbing the back of his neck. Hearing the answer, Penemu put both hands on her hips and sighed heavily. I should have figured it out. Always everything at the last minute. By the way, did you get a match? Azazel's question made Issei remember the event that was taking place today. A dangerous look decorated the cadre's face, indicating that he should not continue speaking, or he would be punished. Hum, Azazel simply looked at her. I think you'll miss another year, he commented, looking at her with slight seriousness. Penemu just looked away, lowering her head a little. Azazel and Penemu watched in slight surprise as Issei got up from his seat, facing the cadre. I'll go with her. Penemu's eyes widened after hearing the statement, while Azazel blinked a few times, thinking that he hadn't heard correctly. Seeing their reaction, Issei couldn't help but get a little nervous. Well, if she wants to, and if a demon can participate, of course. No, of course you can participate, Azazel commented, still a bit surprised. But, I don't think she, the cadre interrupted himself when he saw how Penemu pulled Issei's sleeve timidly. I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. Issei turned his gaze after sensing that she was calling out to him, only to be slightly surprised when Penemu lowered her gaze with a small blush on her face. The grip on his sleeve tightened, at the same time that Penemu raised her gaze to meet his eyes. Really? Do you really want to come with me? She asked herself, again looking away from her as she couldn't hold eye contact. Seeing how she was acting, Issei could only think that she looked very cute. This facet was new to her, and she had to say that she quite liked it. Of course, she exclaimed, giving him a big chuckle. Hearing the answer, Penemu looked at him, giving him a small, but cute smile. Thank you. Penemu let her know how grateful she was, when she felt her grip on her sleeve tighten even more. Azazel could only stare at this with wide eyes. She hasn't acted like this since, he thought with great disbelief, before breaking into a big smile. Seriously, that brat has more potential than I had imagined. I should thank him for making Penemu show affection for her again, even if she is only one person. Azazel's thoughts were interrupted when Penemu grabbed his shukata to drag him outside. Let's get to work. We can't waste time. A gleam of conviction graced Penemu's eyes. Hey, wait, Azazel exclaimed, as he was dragged by Penemu. Where did you get so much energy? Issei could only look at the scene with a huge nervous drop of sweat. Line jump. How do I look, Diedrake? Issei asked, adjusting her black jacket. The brown haired was in Penemu's room, trying on a somewhat casual outfit to go out with the cadre tonight. 
Issei looked at himself in the mirror, seeing that his clothing consisted of completely black clothing, except for his shirt, which was white. You look great, mate. The dragon commented through the gauntlet, making a small nod to himself. Perfect. She answered the brunette with a small smile, before looking out the window. Later we would have to thank Azazel for lending me these clothes. I was already very nervous at the thought of going to such an important moment in my academy clothes. He commented with slight concern, as he observed how many colored lights decorated the bridge, while many decorated boats were entering the cave. All of that only indicated that the celebration was about to begin. Issei heard someone knock on the door, so he turned around to receive the person. If you're looking for Penemu, she's making the last preparations for. The chestnut's voice became more and more inaudible, since said person had entered the room. It was nothing more and nothing less than Penemu. She looked much more beautiful than normal, since she was wearing a maid's outfit, something that was impossible for Issei to miss. Penemu stared at him and clasped her hands under her breasts, making her look even more adorable. Do you like it? The question made Issei wake up and stop staring at her so intently. I I didn't know you'd come with a maid's outfit, the brunette commented, rubbing his hair as a small blush decorated his face. It fits you well, he finished, delivering a tone with complete sincerity. This made Penemu happy, and she didn't mind showing it openly. You told me a while ago that a maid's outfit would suit me quite well. She commented, reaching out to him to take his hand. Did you remember that? The chestnut thought with slight surprise in his gaze. Come on. She ordered the cadre with a sweet tone, giving him a smile. Issei could only look at her with even more surprise at her lively attitude. Finally, she reciprocated his attitude, gripping her hand more tightly as he followed her happily. A few minutes later. This is the place, Issei asked Azazel, receiving a nod from him. Everything is completely dark, he commented as he squinted his eyes to try to make out something. That's the idea, Azazel pushed him into the swan-shaped boat, landing next to Penemu. Have a good travel, the leader commented with a slight playful tone, while he went to sit in one of the rear boats. We are lucky to be the first, Penemu declared, making Issei look at her strangely. Upon exiting the cave, we will be able to see and hear the fireworks go off. Although he couldn't see her, Issei was sure that Penemu was very excited. Seeing this always from her room probably hurt him a little, no matter how cold she was about this kind of matter. A millennium of suffering is difficult for anyone to face, and the brunette knew very well about that kind of thing, since he knew Tiamat although in the case of the dragon, it was almost two millennia. Finally, the swan began to move, making Issei slightly excited. He had never participated in an event as such, but he always saw some on TV, and they seemed entertaining. The chestnut waited anxiously, until finally the exit from the cave began to be glimpsed. Out of nowhere, numerous lights came on, completely blinding the protagonist for a few seconds. Issei widened his eyes as he felt how a great blizzard ran through his hair. Her eyes finally adjusted to the hanging lights, at the same time numerous fireworks began to explode in the sky just above the castle, giving an amazingly colorful picture. Amazing. It was the only thing the chestnut could think of, looking at the play of lights with wide open eyes. His attention was drawn elsewhere when he felt Penemu pull timidly on his sleeve. The brunette turned to look at her, and at that moment. In that single moment, he had felt that time had stopped. Penemu's smile her hair waving with complete freedom, her crimson eyes shining brightly in the night light with great joy. She was. She was just beautiful. They both intertwined their hands without even realizing it, totally letting themselves be carried away by the beautiful moment they were living right now. Instead of paying attention to the fireworks, they were looking at each other the entire time, as if one were the most precious attraction in sight for the other. The two only wished that this precious moment would last forever. Line jump. It's been a lot of fun, Penemu declared with a small smile. Issei just nodded in complete agreement as they walked up the stairs together. They were still holding hands. At these instances, they must have realized it by now, but it seemed that neither of them felt uncomfortable with the other's contact. What's more, they both felt really good about it. As the party was still going on, the vast majority of the fallen were outside, so they didn't come across any of them. Finally. They both stopped in front of Penemu's room. Tomorrow afternoon I would like to start making preparations for your training. 
I need to speak with Tiamat and Tannen, so I will go after lunch. She commented the cadre, receiving a nod from Issei. Just when the brunette was about to say goodbye, he could feel how Penemu tightened her grip on his hand even more. I, I would like you to stay with me another night, please. Penemu slightly lowered her head with a slight blush, surprising Issei by the proposal. I'd love to, he commented the chestnut, receiving a smile from the cadre. Issei sat up on the bed and looked away in slight discomfort when he heard Penemu start to remove her clothes. I would like that next year we will also go together. She commented the cadre, causing Issei to look sideways at her for a second. He could see Penemu's bare back as she changed into her white pajamas, while wearing only black lace panties. Why yes, he stammered, unable to avoid blushing and cursing himself for looking away without giving it much thought. Why are you nervous? asked Penemu with a hint of grace, finishing putting on her pajamas, and sitting on the bed. Issei took this as the green light to turn his gaze. Sorry, I can't help it, the brunette commented as he rubbed his cheek with a finger. Just kidding, she said the cadre with a mocking tone, causing Issei to hand her a small pout. Without even giving him time to reproach her for something, Penemu pounced on him, giving him a big hug. She snuggled into Issei instantly, then kissed him on the forehead. This day has been magnificent, she commented the cadre taking his cheeks and staring at him. I owe everything to you. Therefore, tonight I will not let you go. Tonight, it will be just for the two of us. She concluded, giving him another big hug, this time encircling her arms around the chestnut's neck and squeezing him lovingly. Their legs were soon intertwined with each other, making Penemu's feet wriggle with great happiness. I don't plan on going anywhere. She answered the brown one, reciprocating the hug instantly at the same time that she took the opportunity to caress her hair. Sensing this, Penemu began to caress Issei's back with her hands. They both felt amazing with such direct touch. After all, that somewhat indiscreet touch made her breasts even hotter than they already were before. They knew that this heat was a simple sensation, that it was not real. But, that feeling of her breasts burning with each amorous feeling felt too great to let go. It was so great that they could perfectly feel how each other's heartbeats began to speed up slowly because of all the conflicting emotions. Yes, a really comforting feeling. A unique sensation. A unique sensation that can only be produced by that special person. Line jump. Having slept with her for two days, Issei began to think that he could get used to this. After all, it was nice enough to sleep next to the fallen, and it was something she couldn't deny. In fact, it was so like that that they both woke up quite early, and still stayed in bed, since they felt too good to get up. Besides, the fact that their bodies always woke up so stuck together didn't help make them want to get up. Unfortunately for both of them, duty always calls sooner or later. Penemu had to get up reluctantly to continue with her work that he had left behind yesterday, while Issei decided to take a little walk with Azazel, who was still in Grigori. The aforementioned offered him a tour of the entire castle. Issei already had a good image of Azazel since that time he defended him from the other cadres, but he managed to be even more impressed with the routine and non-formal talks, even somewhat elevated in tone, that he sometimes commented on. She didn't like him as much as Penemu at the moment, but he proved to be quite a likable fallen. The fact that he would be the one to command the Grimori group from now on only made him think that they would probably become very close friends in the future. When the long talk with Azazel was over, Issei went over to Penemu, seeing that she was already waiting for him to do the only cooking practice they could do in a long time. And that's how they got to this situation. A somewhat delicate situation for Penemu. The fall tried to put a couple of potatoes in a pot that hadn't even boiled the water yet, making the chestnut tree stop it instantly. First you have to boil the water. She commented quickly, then looked down at the pan. The oil is already smoking for several seconds, you have to hurry to put the meat, unless you want to die of poisoning. The brunette quickly stopped her again. Don't do it with your hands wet. You could set the whole damn kitchen on fire. The chestnut exclaimed with great fear. Penemu placed her hand on her chest instantly, while a cold sweat and a look that reflected too much concern loomed on her face. Luckily for her, Issei had caught her expression instantly. She's being completely overwhelmed the brunette thought, before shaking his head with a small smile. Penemu blinked in slight confusion as Issei came to rest behind her. 
The fallen looked at him intently, indicating that he was searching for an answer. That answer came in the form of a small moan on her part as Issei stuck to her body and took both of her hands, beginning to show her the path she should follow. Penemu observed all the movements with a huge blush, which intensified more and more when she felt how the chestnut's breath hit her neck. Issei began to control her as if she were a robot, putting everything in order. The only thing left was to put the pot on the fire. Unfortunately, Penemu got carried away by the overwhelming situation, causing her hands to slip on the handles, and as a consequence, the Hoya fell to the ground and drenched both of them a bit. I'm sorry, Penemu apologized, quickly bending down to take the bowl. Don't worry, you have to relax, the chestnut commented, while he did the same. Their hand collided with the same handle, causing both of them to raise their heads to look at the other. That only triggered a somewhat delusional situation for both of them. Raising their heads, they were both immensely surprised to have each other close. Very close. In fact, they were so close that their lips were touching. A small blush appeared on both of their faces, while they seemed unable to stop looking at each other deeply. Instead of separating, they both continued to crouch in exactly the same position, making no move. Somehow, their hands that held the bowl ended up intertwined. Silence graced the room, while Penemu slowly closed her eyes while that small blush on her face intensified with the increase in her heartbeat. Guys, I'll be right back. Remember that we still have 27 days to rebuild the academy. Azazel's voice that came from outside the kitchen made both of them wake up from their trance. They quickly got up and put the hole in its place. Don't worry, Issei yelled, walking over to the door. We'll make ourselves something to eat here and come back. Penemu just deigned to fill the hole without saying a word. She touched her lips for a short second, then continued as normal. End of the first part.